Hi, this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi, the founder of The Complete Herbal Guide. Today, I have an amazing guest, and she's back again for her second time. It's Natalie Boehm, and she is the founder of Defeating Epilepsy. And, you know, I'm so, I'm, I'm so happy you can come back to our show and talk more about epilepsy. You know, uh, Natalie has, um, has overcome so many things in her life, and she's here to tell you about her own experience with epilepsy and how she overcame them. And she's going to give you so much valuable information. Natalie, can you tell people a little about yourself and what you do and, you know, let people know more about you? Oh, yeah. Well, first, thank you for having me back. And my name is Natalie Boyam. I'm the president and founder of the Defeating Epilepsy Foundation. We're a 501c3 not-for-profit in Southern California, and our mission is to provide the advocacy and educational resources needed to the epilepsy community in our society. I've battled epilepsy now for 42 years, and despite some of my accomplishments, such as education, being able to work, having a family, I just find still there is such a lack of education when it comes to epilepsy, resulting in a very unnecessary stigma that our society is still placing on people with epilepsy. So through my work, my goal is to create better educational and economic opportunities for people with epilepsy and help to improve their quality of life. You know, I, I find that so many people struggle with epilepsy. You know, I I talk to people every day and I work with people with epilepsy and they, they have so much fear, you know, because people who have epilepsy don't know when their next seizure is going to occur. They they have dreams, they have, you know, ambitions, but they're afraid that they, they, they're, you know, about when their next seizures are going to occur. They, they, you know, they have low self-esteem. And they don't think they can do it. And a lot of them just don't know where to begin, you know, you know, because there's so much, you know, we have a, such a stigmatism in our society about epilepsy. You see people that have breast cancer on TV, you have their organizations and information about it. You see people with diabetes, you see all the time you see things about all these um, conditions and illnesses on the TV. You see even pharmaceutical companies talking about new drugs, about all these different conditions. Now, new drugs are coming out with epilepsy, but you don't see it on TV. There's no. not a lot of information about epilepsy in, on the, in our media. So when people don't understand a condition, it's because they're not well-educated. And when you're not well-educated, you tend to fear something. And epilepsy, you know, there are so many people with epilepsy, but when you, you hear epilepsy, you think of a seizure and people immediately get scared. And the reason why they get scared is because they don't know enough about it. They, they, and they, they know what a seizure is, but they don't understand and they don't know what to do. So they get scared. So, you know, I know that you have a lot of information on your website, and I know that you are so well-educated in this field. Talk about the stigma that we have in our society about epilepsy and, you know, about what you've also noticed in our, our society. Well, I've noticed in society, it's it just the stigmatism starts at the very beginning. I, I mean, I, as a child with epilepsy, I was diagnosed at the age of two due to head trauma. I found in the educational K-12 system, People will face challenges of getting a 504 or IEP or times parents are even scared to get that extra assistance, worried about their kids being discriminated against, trying to make sure they could get everything in. And once you go through the K-12 system, which thankfully we do have protections such as FAPE, which is the free access to public education. So children with epilepsy cannot be denied education. They can have additional assistance, but what people... I found in my generation, the mentality was when I was going through school, it's okay, well, she's going to end up on disability. She's going to end up in a group home. So what are we worried about what the next step is going to be? And that is so far from the truth because people with invisible illnesses like epilepsy or say autism, even though we're listed as having a disability, unless it's something where they cannot control it or it's something severe, you're not going to get help. And, you know, children and adults, and that's a big thing is adults as well. I find there's so, such a lack of resources for adults. They need to have the resources, the guidance and be given the tools to have the strength and confidence to take care of themselves or they fall through the cracks of the system. 
And epilepsy is actually one of the hardest conditions to actually get assistance for. It takes years for people. Yeah. So I tell people, please don't assume if you start, if you have a seizure or you start having epilepsy, that you're automatically going to qualify for assistance. A lot of times the answer to that is no. And we have to make a plan on how to take care of ourselves. And I will say it's easier said than done. It was, there was plenty of times in my life. I just... I didn't, I didn't even know where to begin. And I found the reason I finally had to learn where to begin was I knew if I wanted to survive, I had to do something, not rely on my neurologist or rely on others to get it done for me. I had to take action for myself and advocate for myself. You know, and explain to people, you know, you have an amazing story because you were in law school, you were, you know, you had so many goals and dreams and your epilepsy kind of, you know, stopped you from, from doing the things in life that you originally planned. Now tell people exactly, you know, what, what happened in the beginning, because, you know, it's amazing. You were studying to be a lawyer and your epilepsy kind of hindered some of your dreams, but you didn't let that stop you, which is amazing. And I love it. So talk yeah. to me a little about that. So the audience understands well I I didn't go to law school because of my epilepsy what happened was I did my undergrad in um, pre-law I did a camp I did my associate's degree in paralegal studies and then I went and did a degree in li liberal studies for a pre-law combination and when I was in my last year of my undergrad I was getting ready to prepare for my LSAT to go on to law school and I had a seizure without warning on the interstate and crashed my car I lost my license for a year and then continued to have some complications and I didn't get my license back for a year and a half so at that point, my goal was I have to finish school. I have to get a job because I'm going to need medical benefits. I knew right then, you know, my dream of being an attorney just went out the window within minutes. And it was a very, it was very, not even so much the um, physical recovery of the seizures, but the emotional and mental impact yeah. it had. A lot of people don't realize the emotional and mental impact epilepsy has on someone. Oh, Yeah. And I mean, I won't lie, I went to a very severe depression. I felt I failed at that time. I couldn't see past, um, what was I going to do with my life? How was I going to survive? Yeah. I was just obsessed with this. I can't go to law school now because my health, I'm not strong enough, you know, physically right now to get through a program like this. And it really took um, a very bad, it was a very negative impact on my health. You know, I could totally, you know, when you talk, we have so much in common and I feel like I want to cry because, you know, I had, I had done the same thing. I had gotten several degrees in college and I was on my way and I had so many goals and, you know, at that point, my seizures too weren't controlled and all those goals kind of went out the window. You know, I was headed, you know, for superstardom and all of a sudden epilepsy kind of took control of my life, you know, because yes. at that point I wasn't controlled. So I, you know, things happened in my life and I was not able to do exactly what I planned in my brain, but, you know, I find that, you know, that happens to a lot of people with epilepsy. And I also went into that depression that you were talking about, but you know what? We didn't let it overcome us. We didn't let that depression continue just like you you yeah. defeated it just like your organization's name how did you defeat it how did you get yourself out of that depression and how did you move forward and start your new life because you know what one road might end but that doesn't mean life ends oh no it doesn't you know there are many paths and many ways we can go so tell people how you did not let that epilepsy our condition defeat you how did yeah. you go about that well, the, a lot of it had to do with, I didn't have a very supportive family. You know, I love, I love my family, but unfortunately there's a lot of toxicity and where I forgive my parents is where you see so many resources now that they're bringing forward, um, having pediatric, um, epileptologists, having so much more than we did, you know, 20, 30 years ago when oh, yeah. we were younger, I mean, my neurologist attitude to my parents was give her her medicine. If she has a seizure, call an ambulance. Right. That was the whole training. That yeah. was the whole service. And because they, they were overwhelmed with the side effects of these meds, they were overwhelmed with the limitations that we had on our lives because of this. 
you know, you know, I know they love me as their daughter, but I feel at times they just didn't know how to deal with a chronically ill child. No. They didn't have the support and it drove a wedge between us. So when I knew I could not rely on my parents for assistance, I realized, well, if I want to survive, I'm going to have to have to work. I'm going to have to, you know, be able to drive and do these things, which means I got to get my seizures under control. Right. And the neurologist I had at the time did not support that. He was trying to push me to go on disability. And I said, no, I'm not complying with this. You're putting me in a situation where I knew I could very easily end up homeless right. if I didn't do the right thing. And one day he got frustrated with me and said to me, why can't you be a good girl and go on disability? And when he said that to me, I was so taken aback. I just sat there. I didn't even know what to say to him. Yeah. But every so often over the years now, it's played back in my life, my, you know, my mind. And if I could go back in time and just say what I want to him, I would, I would simply say, I can't be a good girl because good girls don't get anywhere. I got to be a strong woman if I'm going to survive this good, you know, being good, good and submissive isn't going to get us to the goals we need in life. We have to be strong and ready to take the step. You know, and I'd like to know personally, because I talk to so many people with epilepsy and they suffer from low self-esteem because in life, you know, like you said, either you have overprotective parents or you have parents that are kind of toxic, not because they want to, they just don't know how to deal with it themselves, exactly. you yeah. know? And so, you know, they fear the, the disorder themselves. And sometimes it's even hard for them to accept that they have a daughter or a son that's epileptic, epileptic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, ha you know, when you suffer from epilepsy, a lot of people suffer from low esteem, low self-esteem, low self-esteem means lack of courage, lack of strength, lack of faith, lack of hope. How did you get the strength how did you get that hope though, and and get get that self esteem to become? Because you were said you were in depression like I did, and you, oh, yeah. you got out of that. So that means you you gained strength, you gained courage because you said I'm going to do it myself. How did you get that? Like, how, what was the things you did to get to the next level of life so you could be the girl, the person, the woman that you wanted to be? I just I made up my mind I wanted to survive, and I knew by to, to serve, um, surviving, I had to be willing to get the help. I had to be willing to take the steps. And I will say as much as I've accomplished, the reason I have gotten to this point has not been just myself, but my husband. My husband has been, you know, my best friend. He's been my caregiver. He's been my advocate. He's been, he's had to walk so many different steps for me. So even as I was accomplishing things when I was younger, I know with the changes I've had in my health, especially the past couple of years, I've had some um, long haul COVID, post COVID complications. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be alive now without him. Right. I wouldn't. I wouldn't have made it this far without him. So I have to say, even though I've done a lot, a lot of it comes down to is having the right support system, oh, having the right person yeah. behind you can make yeah. or break a situation. You know, we talked about this prior in other conversation that we had, and I wanted to cry back then too, because, <laughs> you know, I, 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 you know, I have a husband also that I, I met when I was 19, you know, in my first year of college when I, and, you know, he's been there ever since. And like you said, <laughs> he's seen some pretty bad things and he was there still to support me. He was always my rock, just like your husband was, but not everybody has that. So when yeah. people don't have that, that support, you know, I'm sure there's things on your website also, uh, and there's, you know, places that they could go to, to get that support because not everybody has friends that will catch them when they fall. Not everybody yeah. has positive friends that will give them positive, you know, um, uh, advice and, and pump them up and give them the hope that they need. So on your website, do you have support groups that could kind of like help people if they don't have that support that you and I were lucky enough to have? I have on our website at www.defeatingepilepsy.org. We have a tab at the top called Community Resources, and we have all sorts of different services for mental health, veterans, um, if you need prescription assistance, career assistance, if you're struggling between jobs. I list all sorts of different resources that I find. And then also, if there's something there, you know, you're not sure about it, please contact me at 909 740 
888-448-4461 or info at defeatingepilepsy.org. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. And I'm happy to also get you connected to the right people. I've had a number of people reach out to me in situations. For example, I've had a couple of people even reach out to me from different parts of the country yeah. and I help them get connected to local organizations. We'll contact 211 and see specifically what's there so we can get a plan going and help getting them in the right direction, getting the help they need. That's amazing. And you know what, when I have spoken to people, people don't realize that each state has an epilepsy foundation and some people don't even yes. know what the epilepsy foundation is, but there is a foundation called the epilepsy foundation. It's in one, every state has one. And the main one is in Washington, DC, and they have a lot of um, support groups. Also, they have a lot of people that they can direct people to each state has support groups, you know, that all, they can also, you know, help with also. Now, do you, uh, are you affiliated or do you um, do anything with the Epilepsy Foundation? Um, unfortunately, I'm not. And not because I don't want to be affiliated with them. I'm finding what the um, frustration is between all these, you know, organizations. There's such a lack of collaboration. Mm -hmm. And I find that many of them look at small grassroots organizations like mine as competition instead of an mm -hmm. opportunity to work with. And I mean, our location in Washington is wonderful. They're, bring, they're working very hard to get a lot of funding for research, for improving medication and other sources of care. But because they're so focused there, which they need to be, I think a lot of the people who work there because they're not affected by epilepsy really don't understand the impact of our quality of life. Medicine, yes, medicine is keeping me alive. It's keeping you alive. Along with, I do, I have supplements. I do yoga. I work. I do a variety of things yeah. to stay healthy. But medicine is only one piece of the puzzle. Oh, definitely. We are not advocating enough for mental health care with people with epilepsy. I would love to see the Epilepsy Foundation go to these HMOs, these PPOs, and say, you know what? Medicine can only do so much. Our neurologist and epilepsy epileptologists can only do so much. Mm -hmm. This is just one piece of the puzzle. You need to start allowing people with epilepsy to have more access to psychologists oh, so that we can improve their quality of life. Because when I first um, launched my foundation, I do a lot of um, research. I, I find educate, continuously educating myself about what we deal with has really helped um, to heal old wounds. And I found an article that had been published in 2016. And this study they did from 2003 to 2010, in 17 states, they gathered information on patients who did commit suicide. Oh, yeah. And it was just so heartbreaking because yeah. they found when they finally did the statistics that people with epilepsy are 22 times more likely to commit suicide yes. compared to the general population. Yeah. And the biggest age range that is committing suicide is ages 40 to 49. And that has to do a lot with adult onset epilepsy. There are no, there pretty much are no resources yeah. for adults because doctors, not that they don't care, but I think a lot of them really don't even understand what the Epilepsy Foundation could do. So they yeah. don't point patients in that direction. And I have found trying to work with a lot of the other organizations, they're very children, very family oriented, which is good. Families need support. But, you know, where I get frustrated with them is, okay, those children are eventually going to become 18. They're going to become adults. They're going to have to survive. Right. All right. Now, what do they do? You can't exactly. just cut it off and forget about it. And that's what's leading to so many people having additional complications in health, having the financial medical struggles, and sadly, leading down a very dark path where they yeah. finally where they finally do give up. And I don't feel anyone, I, I don't care who you are, where you're from, no one deserves to be put in a situation due to any medical condition, not just epilepsy, where they finally say, I've lost everything. There's nothing worth fighting for anymore. I just, I have to end it. It's either be homeless or kill myself. And I don't want to be homeless. No mm -hmm. one deserves that. 
No, no one deserves to be in that situation. Definitely not. You know, I have to agree with you because, you know, um, the Epilepsy Foundation has put a lot of effort into making drugs and new medications. And that's great because it's it's very helpful. We need more medications. We need more um, ways to, you know, help um, individuals with epilepsy control their seizures. But one thing that I've known, noticed and why I've spent so much time doing the things that I do to advocate for epilepsy is that when I go on the internet and I type in the emotional aspects of epilepsy, you know, how to cope with epilepsy, you don't see many articles at all. No. About the emotional part of how do I cope with it? How do I cope with the depression? How do I get to the next step? How do I, you know, build my self-esteem? How do I get over my fear? How do I, how am I able to change my life and feel like I can actually accomplish my dreams and goals? You know, and some people, some women even give up on having a family and children because yeah. they don't think they can because of their disorder, but yet they can. And you know, uh, and I agree with you. They need more organizations like yours to feed an epilepsy because we do lack, you know, inform the informational aspect of the emotional part of epilepsy, which is yes. huge because, you know, I remember I wrote an article and I said, which is worse, the emotional part of epilepsy or the physical part of epilepsy? And people, it was a 50, 50, you know, people, people said both, mostly people were saying both, both of it. Yeah. You That's know, where I, I would be, you know, because, you know, it, when you have seizures, a lot of times we injure ourselves. And when we have seizures, it uh, mentally, it, 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 it puts a damper in our brain, you know, you know, especially if people are doing good and then all of a sudden they have a seizure or they're consistently having seizures. I've met people that have had seizures, like 300 seizures in a day. Can yes. you imagine having 90 to 300 seizures in a day? I've met people like that. I, I can't imagine. Just the thought of it, it exhausts me. Yeah. Just the thought of having to go through that exhausts me. You know, and, you know, we don't have enough information to help people to get through the emotional part. And that is an important aspect that, you know, people need to learn how to emotionally cope with epilepsy. Because if we can cope with epilepsy, we can gather enough of strength to actually live a life that is fulfilling to that individual. Yeah. And, and I think what a lot of it is, and it's so sad to put it this way, it's coming down to money and funding because I talked to a gentleman um, earlier this year who has epilepsy and he works with the um, American Psychological Association. And I asked, you know, how many people are doing articles based on epilepsy and mental well-being or could I write something if we put a team together, could we write something and publish? And he said, well, sadly, no. And I said, well, why aren't you? Do he goes, there's no money in it. They're not going to publish it because they can't make any money from the research. There's no real grant opportunities for it. And to hear that, knowing the statistics that we're seeing in these studies, I'm going, why? And I think really what it comes down to, and you know, I'm not pointing fingers at academics or professors or anything like, or doctors, I'm not pointing fingers at anyone, yeah. but I think because our system is so overwhelmed and there's just such a struggle to tackle these things. We need doctors and psychologists. We need social workers. We need profess. We need these people to come together and collaborate to get projects like this going. Mm -hmm. And myself, or I should say my husband being in academics, he's an associate professor. Mm -hmm. There's so much competition for funding yeah. across the whole spectrum and trying to get, um, a decent sized grant to accomplish something like this. It's either somebody who's looking at this information feels, okay, if we award this grant, we're going to get something really great in return for it. Or somebody was lucky enough to already get their foot in the door and has one so had done so many articles, done so much research where they know somebody who knows somebody. There's sadly, there's so much politics in academics, which there really shouldn't be because no. It doesn't just hurt the schools, it, you know, and that's something I would say, it, it hurts the people who are passionate, who are working for these universities, who yeah. want to do their work and do things like this. Yeah. But then it hurts society in general when we decide, oh, one thing is more important because we know we'll get money from this where, yeah, yeah this is bad what's going on, but what are we going to gain from it? 
and you know it's kind of like push it aside we're not going to talk we're going to imagine it's not there right and that's what's happening with epilepsy and mental health it's oh we're not we're not going to talk about it it's not something we're bringing up mm -hmm. and i hope in time the epilepsy foundation and other organizations that are heavily involved in research mm -hmm. will say to these organizations that they work with in research mm -hmm. you know we need to start bringing things together we it's do. great what we're doing with medicine now we got to start looking at the mental aspect Aspect, the behavioral aspect, you know, the um, when it comes to social behavior, I mean, that's one thing I love about my um, neurologist is he doesn't look at um, and he puts it on his page where where he works. He has underneath his bio what he states, and he's and he states clearly, medicine is one piece of the puzzle. Yes, dietary, mental oh, health, hundred percent. So many things that come into it, and that's just the beginning of learning to control things. Then we have the social aspect. I mean, the one thing that I think still is a weakness for myself, it's so hard for me to socialize at times. Like yeah. being here on Zoom, I'm at least in my office, so I'm in my comfort zone. I'm sure right. people who are listening or watching going, oh, you can't talk? Yeah, right. Okay, put me in a crowded room with people. I'm doing everything I can to fight to make eye contact and not have a panic attack right? because I spent my childhood alone in my room yeah. because the attitude was, well, what if you go to play with a friend and you have a seizure? Well, what if you were to go spend the night and have a seizure? What if you were going to do this and all of a sudden you have a seizure? So mm -hmm. my life was going to school and then going home and I did, you know, did my homework. You know, I loved music. I played Legos. I drew, I had my own little things that helped me to stay balanced and then once I turned 18, it's okay, you got to work, you got to survive. And all of a sudden you're pushed into a society around people. And for people with epilepsy, who I'm sure there's many who can relate to what I just described in my, oh, from my childhood, yeah. you go from isolation to now you're surrounded by society and expected to be this able-bodied person and, and put on this act and keep up with everybody. It's hard. Oh, 100%. it's hard, you know, and even years later now, I got to tell myself if I go to a chamber of commerce event, when, when the one um, chamber I work out here, it, it's an accomplishment. If I can go around to at least a couple of tables and give a business card and get one from them and have a brief conversation, mm -hmm. I pat myself on the back for that. Oh, a lot 100%. of people would say, okay, why? You were just there to talk. You're just there to network. But when you spend your childhood alone and now you're surrounded, it takes years to unlearn that isolation oh, and allow 100%. yourself to be around others and say, it's okay. You know, I shouldn't be isolated. It's okay for me to be around others. It's yeah. okay to be able to be engaged with other people. It, it's very mentally hard. And I think it's a lot of the reason people with epilepsy do stay inside a lot because we haven't been given the chance to, you know, learn the proper social skills. Yeah. And that really, that I think that plays a lot into the mental challenges we have. And, you know, people don't understand, but socializing is a, it's a learned skill. You know, yes. if it's not something that you just acquire, you know, genetically, you know, socialization is, is a, a skill that you learn over the course of your years, going to school, maybe playing with groups of people. I remember when I was a young kid and they would have kickball, they would put me aside and put me on the side of the, on the side of the curb until the game was over because they were oh my goodness. that the ball would hit my head. You know, I would have been oh. fine. It was a little rubber ball. But, you know, yeah. being, being put on the side of the sideline, you know, that, that dampers a kid's brain, you know. And oh, absolutely. It's, it, and not only is it isolation, but it's, oh, everybody looks, she's different. So she can't be with us. Right. That starts the learned behavior of people, of, I hate to say, you know, people don't like using the word ableism, mm -hmm. but I, I believe it's something we do need to start addressing in society. Right. It is children when we're, you know, we come into this world, not, we're not racist, we're not hateful, we're not judgmental. Those are all learned behaviors. Yeah. And then as they become adults in society and trying to justify why making somebody else feel inferior or why they shouldn't be allowed to work or shouldn't be allowed to have kids trying to justify it needs to end and I mean that's one thing I want to give people strength for because I can tell you even despite 
achieving, you know, I have a master's degree, you know, I'm, I'm not complete. I can't completely be independent because of complications I'm having with my health right now. Right. But for years, I was an independent woman. Right. And it, it's very difficult. And even now, as I'm gaining strength and getting back into the workforce more, I, I still have people question my capabilities. I mean, I've had, I had one business owner say to me, you come off as so smart, but I would never hire you. And I said, well, I appreciate your honesty. May I ask why? It was, well, what if you have a seizure on the job? I don't want you suing me for your injuries. What if you have a seizure in front of one of my clients? I'm not losing my business because of that. And I said, well, you know, there's so much you can do to go around that. Now, there's so many different resources where you don't have to have that fear. I go, let's say, for example, you needed someone to do your accounting or data entry for your business. Right. I don't have to be there. I go, I can work right here from my home. Mm-hmm. I could send my information through Dropbox to you. Yeah. And we could meet on Zoom once a week for a meeting. I go, you don't even have to have me on the property. I go, there are ways you can diversify your workforce and make the proper accommodations to put them in a safe environment and know that they can be a productive employee for you. Right. And of course, he, he didn't know what to say. He was shocked that I had that comeback. Yeah, and I'm glad you did. And I mean, the one thing, one of the polit- local politicians in my area, this this was the winner for me. One of the former president of the chamber I used to work with, wonderful woman, introduced me to him one evening. And when I gave him my business card, he looked down at my business card and he went, oh, well, where'd you get your MBA? You know, so I could just verify. And I'm thinking to myself, it took everything me going Oh, did you think I put it the MBA at the end of my name because I thought it would fancy my business cards up? It's like <laughs> I busted my butt to get those letters after my name. You think you kidding me, man? Yeah. I, exactly. I really wanted to rip it to her, but I, you know, I just mentally took a took a deep breath and I went, Well, you know, I went to the University of Redlands. I'm happy to send you a copy of my graduate transcripts and I can reach out to the dean and tell him he has permission to talk to you about me. And I'm happy to have him answer any questions you have during my time when I was a student there. And he just went, oh, thank you. Now, and okay. walked away. He he just, he didn't even know how to answer. I threw him off that fast. Now it took years of building strength to do that. There would have been a time I would have been so embarrassed. I just would have hurried away from him. Right, exactly. You know, nowadays it, you can get into so much trouble. Like I lost, I lost a, a job because someone saw me take a seizure, you know, Aww. but n- nowadays you do that and they they can get into so much trouble. I spoke oh, yeah. in front of Congress about job discrimination. You know, I was appalled, you know, and people, people have to realize that it's, it's just, it's just a condition, just like everything else. I don't think people yes. realize, you know, we have the lack of ability in our society to educate individuals with epilepsy, but tell everybody how many people have epilepsy. Cause I don't think the society realizes because when, even when I went to look to get grants and to get, you know, get extra help to help others with epilepsy, they're like, well, you know, we don't really think that it would be profitable because, you know, you know, it's, it's not a very large group, but tell them how large it really is. There are 3.4 million people in America who are battling epilepsy and globally there are 65 million. So this is this is not a rare disorder at all. And no. so this is something that is common. And what I find ironic is I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people and they'll tell me, oh, you know, my friend has epilepsy. Oh, my nephew has epilepsy. I oh, my my friend, time. my friend's son has epilepsy. So I meet people who have know people with epilepsy all the time. And I'm thinking, if people all know this. Why isn't there more advocacy? Why aren't people who have a loved one or a friend standing up and trying to do more? And I think it's just the fear of being judged. Because it is. even years ago, when um, I first started advocating, I went down to one of the um, Epilepsy Foundation walks in D.C. And I, at that time, the um, Trump had just come into power. They were trying to remove the Affordable Care Act protections that were put in place. I wrote all 100 senators at that time saying, this is going to be a death death sentence 
to my community, if you allow these protections of these protections to be removed and you allow people to lose their insurance, people are going to die. Yeah. Now, of course, the only person who responded to me was our senator at the time, Kamala Harris, and I thank her office for that because when she was our senator, she was wonderful. Anytime I reached out to her office, I got the answers I needed. But I took all 100 of those letters out to D.C., and I met Phil Catone at the walk and showed it to him. Mm -hmm. And he was in shock. He's like, well, why did you bring them to me? I said, if I would have mailed this to you, I go, somebody would have thrown it through the shredder at the office. Yeah. You even made your desk. You wouldn't have known I'd done this. Right. I go, I came here today. I go, I literally flew from one side of the country to the other to tell you I care. I said, I don't, I mean, I won't lie. I broke into tears in front of them. I said, I don't know what more I can do to say I care. Mm -hmm. I go, but this has got to stop. It we got to start doing something. We do. And, you know, it's just, they don't see it long-term. I think that's just what it is, is people aren't seeing the effects it has on others long-term. Yeah. Because you know, epilepsy, a lot of people don't realize this, epilepsy is a comorbid disease, which means other conditions come along with it. Yes. So there's people who have epilepsy who may also have autism. It's very ADHD. high. The two, the two are very high. Yeah. I think it's 30% of people who have autism are also battling epilepsy. Yes. Mm -hmm. All sorts of neurodivergent conditions come with it due to the lack of health care. Many develop myself, including PTSD, yes. autoimmune uh, problems um, develop in time due to suppressed immune systems and stuff. 100%. We're, we're at higher risk for things like dementia. So this is not just a condition. As we go through this journey in life, many things come along with it. Anxiety yeah. and depression from the side effects, PTSD from dealing with things. Yeah. And we just, it goes up and up and just builds. And so now you're not dealing with just, oh, my seizures. Now it's, I have to deal with how do I keep my night terrors from happening? How do I go from having, stop having panic attacks? How do I keep certain episodes from happening so I can keep myself emotionally balanced and not panic or explode or have some type of reaction that people would find awkward or crazy yeah. there's so many things going on in someone's mind as they're dealing with this and as you're trying to recover well, i shouldn't say recover finding a balance to live with it you're also looking at the situations going well i know this could trigger me or could this trigger me or that you it's a learning game yeah and it's a very hard learning game because i've had plenty of people if i've had um an episode, PTSD episode, I get really angry and then I get really emotional. Yeah. And some people look at me more like, are you a child? Are you having a tantrum? And it's, no, I'm not having a tantrum. It's just, you've done something to trigger a past trauma exactly. and you've put me into a full panic attack. Then it's embarrassing that I went into this rage and I become overwhelmed with emotion because I can't stand when I go into a rage. I don't want to be angry with anyone. It's humiliating to lose control. Oh, a hundred percent. And people don't, that don't go through the, the, the condition in life don't understand it because they haven't experienced it. But even if you don't have the condition, you know, if person is well-educated about the condition, they know they fear and they know inside that they are susceptible to these conditions and that one day yeah. they could get them because they are open to it because one condition can lead to another. Exactly. And, you know, and it's, it's, it's very upsetting, you know, and, you know, I have gone through life. I I've had, you know, I've, 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 I've had, you know, um, concussions from, 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 you know, falling to the floor many years ago, you know, yeah. and, you know, people don't realize, but hits on the head could, could lead to dementia. I, my, oh, absolutely. My, my uncle had tr tripped on the floor and he had other illnesses and he hit his head and he developed dementia from the hit on the head. So people don't understand the fear. I've known people that have fell on the floor, hit their head and never woke up from epilepsy. Oh my goodness. So people don't understand the fear of people that go have epilepsy, what they go through in life and that these people need medical attention. They need help. They need emotional yes. help to get through 
these this condition. They need to learn how to cope because with the right coping skills, just like any other um, condition, just like people who, who suffer from chronic stress or suffer from other illnesses, you know, you could get through it with the right help, with the right coping oh, yeah. skills. You know, if someone teaches you step by step how to cope with epilepsy, you mentally, by strengthening your mentality, can overcome so much and you yes. actually learn to live a happy, healthy, and productive life with your illness because you are balancing it. Mentality-wise, you are learning how to cope with your illness. You are learning how to cope with your seizures, and you can move on in life. Even though you have this illness, whether it's controlled or not, you could still cope. And yes. also, you mentioned another important factor that I want to bring up, if you don't mind. You yeah. talked about how it's not just popping a pill, but we have to live a healthy lifestyle. Many yes. people I have spoken to that even have spoken to doctors that I have spoken to, they get angry because they're taking the medication and they're not controlling their seizures. But then you ask them, okay, tell me a little about your lifestyle. And they're living such an unhealthy lifestyle, whether they're not getting sleep, whether they're incorporating alcohol with their medication, whether yes. they're not eating foods, healthy foods, you know, because even a, in, a high intake of sodium and inflammation in the body could cause can cause triggers they're under a lot of stress which can cause seizures people yes. have to understand that they need to have a healthy lifestyle and they need to live within their limitations absolutely hate, hate that word limitations but in order to live a, a healthy lifestyle in order to possibly control your seizures lessen your seizures or prevent your seizures we have to change our life accordingly to what works for us as a person. How do you feel about that? I feel very strongly about that. It's very true. I mean, I have to eat well. I'm not I'm not the most perfect with my nutrition, but I avoid processed with, food because, you know. <laughs> <laughs> because it, you know, like you said, inflammation. And as I've gotten older, I haven't been officially diagnosed with fibromyalgia, but I'm showing symptoms that in it. I'm in the process of um ruling out any autoimmune complications we're trying to figure everything out mm -hmm. so i've ha i've had to learn what can i eat when what can i not eat right. when i'm stressed i do yoga or i work out or i go in the yeah. garden you have to learn tools to calm down i mean yeah. if you i find so many people who go into such a state of depression they just sit in front of the tv all day right. and i'm like just sit in front of the tv all day it's just going to depress you worse it's going to stress you out it's going to make your seizures happen. Even if you can't go outside, find something that makes you happy, yeah. like drawing or reading, you know, something that brings you peace, brings you balance, you know, do it because the one frustration I had when I was younger, I didn't use all these tools. And then if I was still having seizures, well, we'll add this medicine on. Oh, that's happening. You're depressed. Well, let's add an antidepressant. Oh, that antidepressant isn't working anymore. Let's add another one on. And before you know it, you're you're a walking pharmacy. And you're, the side you're, you're, effects, you're, right? Of all these yeah. medications. And the, then they're just, they're giving you one medicine to treat a side effect of this med. And then they got to give you something to treat the side effect of this meds. And that's not the solution. And right. I hope, I'm hoping as the younger generation of doctors are coming in, and I am seeing it with some. Good. I mean, my doctor you know, wants to know how I'm doing nutrition wise. Am I exercising? What do I do with for my depression? And I even love the fact that um what was it? One day we I was at in a telemedicine appointment with him. And he said to me flat out, Okay, so what are you doing about birth control? And I mean I was shocked because no neurologist, you know, at least in my experience, wants to talk about intimacy, sex, family right. plan. You got to drag it out of some of the doctors. Yeah. So I kind of went like this. I'm like, really? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and he was going to laugh. And I go, well, you know, we're, we're done baby making. He goes, oh, I'm sure you are. He goes, you have your hands full, but you still can conceive. So I want to know, what are you doing? And I thought, you know, it made me happy that yeah. he took that approach with me. Like, I want to know you're doing the right thing. I don't want you to have an unplanned pregnancy and it puts you and a baby at risk. I, it's, it's crazy to say it took 42 years to find a doctor who would do that. You know, people don't realize, but it, it took me a very long time. It took me decades to find the right doctor. I went from doctor to doctor to doctor. Yeah. People have to realize that just because they're, they're seeing one doctor that if they're not feeling comfortable with that doctor or they're not seeing progression or they, and they're not seeing improvement in their, in their condition, 
that uh -huh. they don't have to feel like there's they have to stick with that doctor. Don't be afraid to get a second, third, fourth, fifth opinion exactly. until you find the right doctor. Because even my doctor, you know, I, I went from doctor, 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 and finally I found one doctor that was just amazing and sat yeah. there for the first time. He was the first doctor that sat there. He liked this. He was absorbing everything I had to say, never interrupted me. And he just took in everything because he wanted to know because he wanted to give me the proper care and attention. Exactly. That's and, how my doctor is now. It's yeah. like the first time we met. I because I remember in the past, you always met for a doctor first time. You might get, you were lucky if you got 30 minutes, we put a plan together. We started something. And then after that, you saw them every six months and right. it was, okay, you're doing good okay well let's try this okay out you go I'll see you in six months and it, it just didn't work where no. when I met my doctor here you know we actually sat for a couple hours I didn't, I didn't even realize how long we had sat there and went through my whole health history yeah and even with the frustrations I was having with um that I had with the former doctor with tests you know I he um was he released the um records to my current doctor and my doctor went okay, someone read this, said it was this, someone read it, said it was that. And he just, he goes, this is what we're going to do. Let's pretend this didn't happen. The past is the past. We're going to discard this and we're going to start fresh. We're going to find out what's going on and we're going to move forward. And it was so great to hear that, that yeah. he wasn't just going to rely on something. He wanted to see the evidence for himself before he made any decision when it came to my health and well-being. And I also tell people when they say, I'm seeing a neurologist or I'm seeing a doctor, you know, some neurologists, they are, they know only the basic information about epilepsy because yes. that's not their specialty. You need, you know, in my area, I'm in the New York area. So we have a lot of facilities that focus on epilepsy in our area. And I went to an epileptologist, a doctor who just specializes in epilepsy. That's all this doctor does is epilepsy, epilepsy, epilepsy. And the yes. whole clinic is devoted to epilepsy. So, you know, they are, you know, depending on where you live in the United States, it's good to find a doctor that knows a lot about epilepsy. And if you can find a clinic or find a doctor that specializes in epilepsy that you feel comfortable with or knows a lot about epilepsy, to try to find a doctor that you can actually feel comfortable with and talk to. And I always tell yes. people, be your own doctor. Yes, they can give you the right medications. They can give you information. They can do a lot for you, but you it's up to you, the person, to educate yourself about your disorder, understand what you have, understand all the pros, the cons, everything. And also it, it's a good idea to make a list of questions before you see your doctor. Keep a journal, Absolutely. keep a calendar. And for women, I always tell them, you know, write down when you ovulate and menstruate, because a lot of women I've spoken with tend to have seizures around menstruation and ovulation when their hormones start to fluctuate. So yes. it's always good to keep a journal, write down when you're having seizures, what type of seizures you're having, see if there's any correlation, you know, and, and educate yourself. You know, it's Absolutely. not just up to the doctor, you know, it's up to you too. How do you feel about that? I feel very strongly about that. The one thing I'm glad, I'm glad you um, brought up is the um, fact that seeing a neurologist doesn't mean they're an epilepsy specialist. That's very true because the previous neurologist I saw when, um, before I saw my current neurologist, his focus was stroke and Parkinson's. Right. So, I mean, I would, it, it was kind of funny when I first started going there, the majority of his patients were 65 and up. And mm -hmm. here I am in my 40s, and they're kind of looking at me like, <laughs> you're a baby. What are you doing in here? You shouldn't be here. And I'm thinking, eh, I've been here since I was two. I, I agree with you. I wish I didn't have to be here with you. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you know, it felt so awkward. Yeah. And, and then when I realized, well, that's why, you know, it was, you know, it, it, it's so many people don't understand the dynamics of it, where I feel my frustration where I really have empathy for people with epilepsy is they don't really understand that they have the right to say no if they're not comfortable with a certain treatment or uh, what a doctor is advising they have the right to seek a second opinion yeah and a lot of people are so afraid to say no to a doctor I've I was guilty that. of that myself mm -hmm. they're afraid well if I anger the doctor the doctor won't take care of me 
if you have a doctor like that, do as I say, or I'm going to dismiss you, please get away from that doctor. 100%. That is a red flag right there that yes. that doctor does not have your best interests at heart if they're not willing to either educate you more about it, say, I understand you don't want to do it, but based on your condition, these are the options we have. We've tried this. It didn't work. I'm just going down the list of what I can for you. That's what they should. Then if you have a patient who's still being stubborn, you know, rather than get angry and say, I'm just going to dismiss you, say, you know, I know somebody, if you want to take a second opinion, here are a couple of names, you know, go talk to them. If you're happy, you know, I wish you the best. If you still want to work with me, then come back. Be be professional about it. 100%. But I find, I find what a lot of it is, is patients don't understand the rights of who they can see or how to go about it. I had a mother, when I first launched my organization, reach out to me. Her daughter has epilepsy and she was having a very difficult time. She was on Depakote, which I, I was on myself when I was a teenager. I, I was on that drug also. And it's I had horrible, horrible side effects yeah, to the point where me either. I I attempted suicide twice. It, it, wow. it went that I was that mentally depressed, and her daughter stopped taking the Depakote and went to status. And I I really feel it was kind of like what I did as a teenager with the attention of hoping she was going to wake up again. Yeah. Well, when they went to the neurological clinic, instead of the nurse practitioner going talk to me. Why would you do this to yourself knowing what the consequence could be? What made you want to hurt yourself like this? She told her off in front of her mother and told her never to do it again and she better do what she needs to do and everything. And I told the mother, I said, first of all, you have to file a grievance against that nurse. That is patient abuse. She yes. has no right to yell at your daughter like that and put her down, humiliate her like that. 100%. Two, why isn't she with the neurologist? Well, she, they told me she didn't need to be. I said, oh, she does for two reasons. One, stopping her medication. That was a cry for help. She's yeah. done. She is on her last leg. She is done with this. Two, the fact that these seizures aren't controlled, the neurologist needs to step in and do what he can to get them under control. Right. See, the, the I'm not against, you know, um, nurse practitioners or um, physician assistants, but really... I find in areas like epilepsy, the time they should be stepping in is if you have a patient, okay, the seizures have been controlled for years. The system is in place. There really doesn't need to be any adjustments. They can meet with them. And then if something needs to be changed, like medication or something suddenly happens, then the doctor gets involved again. So I'm, I'm not anti-nurse um, practitioner or things like that. But when something is not under control like this, when you have a situation where a patient cannot get their seizures under control, I'm sorry, there's a reason we have neurologists. There's a reason we have epileptologists. They need to be involved in those cases. And people have to also understand that, you know, sometimes if the, if the epileptologist or the neurologist is busy, sometimes they will mm -hmm. say, okay, the um, nurse practitioner is there. And you have the right to say, no, I would not like to see the nurse practitioner. I want to see Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so or Dr. Exactly. So-and-so. Exactly. You know, that you have the right to, you know, to reject that. That just because the person on the other line making the appointment says you're going to see so-and-so, you as a person, as the patient, the pe person who is paying for this visit, yes. has the right to say, no, that's not what I would like. I would like this instead. And that's what the mother couldn't get over because when I told her that, the first thing she asked me was, I can do that? And I said, of course you can. You're her caregiver. I said, if that, if that doctor's name is accepted on your insurance plan and they'll cover it and you feel she should be with a doctor and not a nurse practitioner, I go, you have every right to call that office and say, no, do not put my daughter with the nurse practitioner. I want her with the neurologist. I said, they cannot deny you that. And she was just in shock, the, the fact that she had these type of decisions. And I think what the problem is, is there's so many limited neurologists and epileptologists in our country. For example, yes. my, um, my medical plan had two. And the one, I had a horrible experience with him. And the second one had even worse reviews than the one that I was seeing. So I have, mm -hmm. I have, um, wanted to see my current neurologist. I had to file two appeals just mm -hmm. to get the thumbs up. 
And I told them, look, I try. I went to one of your neurologists. It didn't work. And luckily, I called my HMO. My HMO stood up for me because I said to them, I go, look, it's simple. I go, I want to be your most cost-effective patient. Right. Let me see a doctor I can trust. Let him do the test he needs and let us put a game plan to place. That way, all we have to do is twice a year, I talk to him. Hey, how are you? Great. Any seizures? Nope, I'm doing great. Awesome. I'll see you in six months and we're done. Right. I'm not in and out of the hospital. I'm not doped up on a bunch of stuff. I'm not, you know, at the point where I need some type of assistance from the system. I can take care of myself. We can apply the KISS principle to this. Right. Of course, the moment I put it in terms of saving them money, that's when it got approved. Right. And it took another two months after that just to get to see him. So this was an eight months journey just to get to see a doctor. It's and crazy. It's in, oh, it's insane. I mean, I feel lucky because my seizures are controlled and, you know, I'm dealing with some of the post COVID challenges and other complications, right. but at least I'm, you know, I'm where I need to be for the most part. 100%. I can't, I can't imagine someone who is having seizures on a daily basis or they're having complications with medicine and they're just trying to find the right doctor to go to Oh yeah. And they, they, asking someone to wait eight months when they have epilepsy. Mm -hmm. That could kill them. Oh, that definitely. right there, that that right there could be a death sentence to them. And it's I'm sorry, it's not acceptable in, in our system. No, I don't it, think it's it acceptable not. anymore. It's not. And even with me, you know, I had to purchase, you know, a higher plan. Like my husband, you know, is a doctor, so we have to, you know, buy our own health insurance. So it comes out of our own pocket. Yeah. And for my plan he had to buy a more expensive plan in order to cover the expenses of my medications and to and to cover my doctor visits. Oh, I believe it. Other insurances and other plans with that company were not accepting um, the things that I needed for my epilepsy. Because my focus yeah. was, I didn't care about anything else. I need my medication. I need it yeah. covered. And I need to be able to see my doctor. And, you know, and I couldn't, you know, I've been with my doctor for over 25 years, you know, and I was not going to change my doctor by no means. Oh, I don't blame you. And I don't blame you at all. It, it's not fair. And even, even with today, I had to go through this whole thing. I got letters sent about my medications because my seizures are not controlled by generic drugs. I, I, my seizures are controlled, but I have to take brand medication. And the difference between brand I learned and, and generic is they have the same ingredients, but the outside coding is different. And on brand medications, it usually has a slower time release, which means it stays in the body longer. So for whatever reason, the brand was controlling my seizures, but if I took the same medication generically, my seizures would not be controlled. So it was a must that all my medication was brand. And I was oh, getting wow. a lot of hassle from the insurance company. Now we were talking about this prior, before we went on, we were talking yeah. about medications and how costly medications are. And you said that your medication was like a thousand dollars a bottle. My medication is between 1600 to $1,800 a bottle. Now, could, oh, wow. you, could you imagine the people who don't have the ability to have good health insurance or don't have health insurance at all? What oh, they my have gosh. to go through, you know, but they are ways that they, you know, that they can get these medications, but they have to make the right phone calls and they have to learn more about what the state and the nation offers. Now, I know your website talks about some of these issues. Can you yeah, we have, we have some of the um, listings for prescription assistance on our website in our community resources program. But a lot of times too, the one thing I am happy to see is a lot of the um, doctor's offices are starting to see the need for being um, affiliated with organizations like Good RX or Robert Wood Johnson's Foundation. Yes. I forget the name of theirs, but I think it's Scripps, but they made one to mm -hmm. help patients get affordable medication. And you can reach out to the pharmaceutical company if there's something where your neurologist doesn't have the information. Don't be afraid to call 
the farm of the uh, pharmaceutical company and say, do you have a patient assistant program? Because a lot of these pharmaceutical companies actually do. There is a percentage they that they will put aside to help patients who are struggling to get their medications. And I wish I had known this years ago myself, because like you were saying about my medicine, at that time, I was on three medications and the total of the three of them were $1,000 a month. And that's why I, at that time in my life, I wouldn't tell anyone I had epilepsy thinking, okay, if I tell the wrong person and I lose my job and benefits, right. at that time, I was making around 2000 a month when I was working. That was half my income right there, right. my medicine. That's I mean, insane. that was my rent, that was my car note and a couple of my bills. I mean, do I do I keep a roof over my head or do I take the medicine I need to stay alive? Right. And a lot of people with epilepsy are on medications that are thousands of dollars a month and they are not told about these resources that are available and it's scary. Yeah. And I think the reason that it really frustrates me is seeing the situation with the name brand generic and the fighting about it was a lot of people, you know, I, I try so hard not to speak politics, but like I went, when I was doing my master's, I went over to South Africa for 10 days to um, do a study abroad for business. I was being with a number of corporations and I had the honor to meet with one of the parliament members in South Africa. And I was telling him about my work as an epilepsy advocate. And I said, well, for people who have epilepsy and other chronic illnesses here, what is the system like? How is it for them to receive care? He goes, well, if they have private insurance and, you know, they have somebody who can help take care of them, you know, the medications there, the resources are there. I go, okay, what if they can't work? What right. if they are on the social system? Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of our government hospitals due to, you know, sadly the corruption that happened over the years, you know, they're really not up to the levels they should be. And then there's, you know, generic medicine. I go, well, what if someone is allergic to generic medicine what if they can't take generic they can't get name brand i go you won't make an exception for any patient he goes well we don't have the funding to do that and i thought to myself oh my goodness the, how many how many people would die an unnecessary death because they wouldn't give them the name brand pill compared to the generic and then i later found a friend of mine who lives in belfast now actually left south africa for that reason yeah. She could not, she could not get name brand Tegretol. They said, no, you can have carbamazepine. She said, I can't take it. And finally she just, it was stay there and die or move to a whole nother part of the world That's to have crazy. a second chance. And I'm thinking how many people have that opportunity to go, okay, it's not working here. I'll just move to another country. Right. Most people can't do that. No, and they can't. And that's why I'm looking here and I'm thinking people here with the resources and funding and everything that this country has, there's no reason people should have to fight and say, I deserve to be alive. Please give me my name brand meds. Yeah. It, it, it comes down to, I have to be straight. It comes down to greed that, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't, I don't like getting all confrontational when it comes to certain things, but at the yeah. same time, it's just sadly in situations like this, you got to tell it like it is. Yeah, no, I agree with you. You know, when I, I got letters and, you know, I had to prove that I had to, that, that brand name was a necessity for me. I was panicking because they gave me a deadline and I'm like, well, what happens if I don't get this, you know, through by the deadline, you know, I can't yeah. go on generic, you know, I don't want to have seizures, you know, and I'm, so I'm putting it through. I called up my insurance company and my insurance company called the pharmaceutical company and they had immediately, you know, they actually gave me even a discount on the medication and yeah. they don't realize that people don't realize, but if you contact the pharmaceutical company or even, you know, the pharmaceutical company will try to help you. And if you don't yes. have insurance or you have limited insurance, they will go out of their way to try to help you, but you need to ask. You need to call and actually speak to somebody and ask because they don't broadcast that they give this help. Exactly. It's all quiet, you know, and that's another thing. The media, there's, there's a lack of education in our media try, that can help people with epilepsy. One, we need to show people how to cope with epilepsy because there's not yes. hardly anything about epilepsy about how to cope with it. Two, we need to educate people on how to approach doctors and what they're entitled to 
from their doctor and what, you know, they, they need from their doctor and get, you know, and we also have to be able to, you know, have to educate the public about epilepsy and, you know, and make people realize that there are a lot of people in this world that have epilepsy and we need to show people how to live with someone or how to help somebody if they have a seizure and that you can't discriminate because that person is no different than the person next to them. Just like if I was yeah. sitting next to somebody that had an anxiety disorder, I have epilepsy. What's so different? We both have conditions. Why exactly. should one be treated differently than the other? Exactly. Someone could be on, on their job and have a chronic panic attack and I could be on my job and have a seizure what's the difference? We both are having a problem at that moment. It needs to be addressed. The public needs to be educated so they know how to handle the condition. So exactly. they get more information out in our public to help people understand different conditions, including epilepsy, which is a big one because there's not a lot of information, and show people how to help someone with epilepsy. These are well, when it, when it comes to the media, I feel we need to have more of an educational um, approach on it. Because the one thing that I think frustrates me with the media or the say entertainment industry, even you see some of these shows that, you know, over exaggerate about what a seizure is. And I think yeah. a lot of that instills fear in people oh, or yeah. it causes things like the one thing that infuriated me was um, when they had that seizure challenge on TikTok. When I saw people were laughing and faking having seizures, I thought what I would give oh my to God. wake up. Well, I know it was awful. I didn't even know it, they had that. They did a while back. There were people going down there pretending to have seizures and taping themselves and laughing about it. And I thought to myself, I, I just shook my head. I'm thinking, I hope you never have a real one. Yeah. I, I hope that's the closest you ever get to thinking of anything because it's the most horrible feeling where you don't have control of your body. And I think a lot of people, because they don't understand there's so many different types of seizures, yeah. they assume it's just the tonic clonic. And that's there's... the one that's always demonstrated in the media. If someone has a seizure, yeah. which they rarely do, but once in a while you'll see it in a show, they only show the tonic clonic seizure. They don't show exactly. all the, any of the other seizures. And there's so many different variants of seizures. Oh yeah. I mean, I've had in my lifetime, I've had tonic clonics. I've had simple and complex partials. I've had about three or four different types of seizures as my health has changed over the years. And tonic clonics, you know, a lot of people found this ironic that I said this one time, I said, I felt safer to a degree when I had tonic clonics before complex partials. And they're like, well, how could you say that, you know, tonic clonic could kill you. It's harder to recover from. I go, but here's the thing. People, when they saw me, if I had tonic clonic, knew what was going on and knew what they had to do. So when I have a complex partial, I come off as if I'm under the influence of drugs. Or I've been mm -hmm. drinking too much and I can't, you know, I can't communicate. I can't comprehend. I can't comply. I go, those are the situations where if EMTs and law enforcement do not have the proper training. That's when people get arrested yeah. or they get tased. And they traumatize the person who's had the seizure, but it's also traumatic for the officer who's thinking, okay, I, I have a drug drug addict who's not complying with me, and then realizes after, no, this wasn't a drug addict, this was some, an epileptic, we were having a medical emergency, and I didn't realize it was a medical emergency. It's why education is so essential, not yeah. just for people with epilepsy, but the whole community is affected by things like this. And I think so many people don't get it. When I, I made seizure first aid posters through my organization, you can get them on our website. They're in both oh, English and Spanish, along with seizure ac action plans in English and Spanish for people to download and use. I put at the end of my first aid, which the other organizations don't, that if law enforcement arrives before EMT, let the law enforcement officers know the person has epilepsy and is having an epileptic seizure. Right. So they are aware and they know what steps to take or they can, um, you know, how can I say, you can explain this is what they do. We're just trying to get them, you know, to safety until it ends. Yeah. Because I've known people and it breaks my heart, but I've known people who said to me, yeah, I regained consciousness in a jail cell a few times. Mm -hmm. Who deserves to regain, regain consciousness in a jail cell? That's horrible. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is. I mean, thank God it's never happened to me. But the thought of, you know, going through a seizure and when I regain consciousness, all of a sudden I'm in this 
enclosed environment, not knowing where I am, I know it would scare me to death. And I, I don't think, I think it would trigger my PTSD. I don't know if I could get past something like that. Well, even like a focal or a, or aura. Aura yeah. is just a sensation. You know, everyone has different types, but it's a signal yeah. basically telling you that another seizure is going to occur, you know, or a seizure will occur. It's a warning signal. Or yeah. sometimes people just get auras and they don't get the seizure. But, you know, at that moment, they're getting different feelings, sensations, confusions. And then even with focals, you're kind of like just looking through the person, you know, you're getting oh, your yeah. eyes sometimes become glassy. You're just like in a daze, you know, and people, so many people, even I talked to that they were in school, young children, and people didn't understand why they were reacting the way they did. And then they went to a doctor and they're like, your, your child has epilepsy. They're having focal seizures, you know? Oh, wow. And so- you know, people have to be more well-educated because I don't even think the educational system knows what to do. Oh, no, they you don't. Know. And the, they're so behind, it's not even funny. And that's one of the reasons um, I really push parents. And I mean, I've talked to some parents out here. My goal is now that COVID is leading up to get more and more engaged with parents and children with helping with these things. But I find that the school districts do not understand these things. They do not understand epilepsy. They do not understand autism, even though they claim, oh, we have these things in place. The teachers and administrators are not trained enough in this. For example, mm -hmm. when um, my son was at a different school, I was working at this time, I was working on my MBA, and I had to answer what the difference was between homogeneous and heterogeneous. I was taking um, an HR course. Mm -hmm. Well, I started to type the word, word homogeneous all of a sudden a light flashed in my face and the head I mean it literally felt like someone put a knife through my head I just grabbed my eye and sat there for a moment I don't know if I seized or what happened right. and when I looked up it told me that I had put an inappropriate word on the thing I'm thinking what is going on well, I didn't realize my son was st still signed into his portal. So even though I was on the university page, it was reading as if it was my son's account. Uh -huh. So they were, that was the punishment, quote unquote, I guess you'd call punishment for putting a bad word on that the flash came. Well, I called the IT and I called the school district and I said, you can kill a child. I go, do you realize if you have students in this district with epilepsy and they're photosensitive and something like that happens, you could kill a child? Yeah. They didn't get it. And then they had the audacity to tell me the principal goes, well, you know, we called the Epilepsy Foundation and they told us it's okay. I said, I'm going to stop you right there because you're lied and I'm going to tell you why. I said, I know the president of the Epilepsy Foundation. I have met him in person. And if you ever call for the line, they tell you right at the beginning, before you even get to a volunteer, that there is no doctor on this call and there is no attorney on this call. You cannot receive legal and medical advice here. These are the volunteers who can help you get certain educational yeah. resources. And I said, the president's son, has epilepsy. I was just going to say that. The president's right. son has epilepsy. Yes. When I, I said, met I him, he was a big right advocate now. for it because his son yeah. had it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I said, I could tell you right now, there is no way he would approve any volunteer telling you it's okay to do that in no, a school he would not. setting. I was so mad. It almost made me want to call Phil and go, you know, I got to I gotta introduce you. To him. <laughs> I go, if you don't believe me, you talk to him. I, yeah. I won't lie. I was furious that he had the audacity to lie to me like that. Yeah. And it just showed me the lack of education and the lack, or I should say, the level of ignorance. Yeah. It almost comes up as some people don't want to learn. And I'm thinking you're in certain professions where this can mean life or death for uh, for an individual. Oh, they have 100%. to know. They have to know what's going on in order to make sure, you know, all these kids are safe. And I mean, when I saw that, that's when I pulled my son out of the school when I could clearly see, because my sons have hemophilia, mm -hmm. he didn't want to be bothered with children with chronic illnesses. In his mind, that wasn't in his job description. And right. I'm thinking, well, why are you a principal? Because I mean, like what my sons deal with, I don't mean to get off track, but yeah. they have a rare bleeding condition that affects 20,000 Americans, 200,000 people worldwide, a fraction, a fraction of epilepsy. Wow. So it's, 
I have to, be, you know, I don't like being mama bear, but there's times I have to be for my son's safety. A hundred percent. And that's really, I think, what also gave me the strength to advocate for myself because here I have two sons, each with a rare bleeding disorder. My youngest has an inhibitor, which means his body rejects a lot of the treatments. And thank goodness, a lot of the newer medication is working for him. Yeah. But, you know, I had to show him, I had to teach my children from the beginning. You, you know, the doctor and you are a team. Yeah. You have to ask questions. You have to understand how this you know, this works. And even with my, um, my oldest right now, you know, I'm teaching him about exercise and nutrition because for over COVID he, he's lost the weight, but he gained some weight during COVID. And, you know, he was really upset. He felt like I was pressuring him to exercise or do certain things. And I finally said, I go, Eddie, here's the thing. I go, you got to take a look at things a lot differently than your friends because of hemophilia. Right. I go, it might not seem like a big deal right now, but if you're overweight all your life, I go, it puts pressure on your joints. You will increase the chances of getting arthritis, honey. And then you could, even when you get older, end up in a wheelchair. Right. I, go, I don't want you in a wheelchair. I want you to be able to live to your best. I go, so I'm not saying it to put you down or control you. I go, I want you to see long-term the whole picture of how decisions can affect what you do. And I mean, it's a weird, it's a weird conversation to have with a 10 year old. Yeah, But I've made myself do it because I wish these were conversations my mother and father would have had with me when it came 100%. to making so many decisions rather than, oh, you know, if we don't ruffle the feathers, we won't get into this, you know, yeah. we'll just keep things the way they are. You can't. Parents have to, you know, involve their children in the decision making as they get older with their, their health care. I mean, I, I I think it's important because of children as they go through teenage years and become adults, yeah. don't know how to speak for themselves, don't no. know how to advocate. And they're always turning, going like, oh, mom will take care of it or dad will take care of it. Or what am I supposed to say? No. Eventually, mom and dad aren't going to be there right. or the caregiver they had may not 100%. be there. And then what do they do? I so think they need to be given those tools. Oh, 100%. And I think this is something we can talk about when you come back next time. Because yes. one, you know what? I, I feel like, you know, um, either one, the parent is in denial. Two, yes. the parent bubbleizes the child. And then the child doesn't know how to fend for themselves. And then when they get into the real world, they're lost. So this yes. is, you know... Will you come back next time and oh, talk about this? I would love to talk about this because yes. I think we also need to, you know, care. The, the People don't realize, but the caregiver goes through a lot. And I didn't yes. realize this till later on in life, but our caregivers, you know, go through a lot taking care of somebody with epilepsy because they love him. You know, that's yes. why they, that's why they're their caregiver because they love them. It's not an inconvenience. But it, it is a tough, it is a tough job, you know, when someone loves somebody and they can't control their illness or their condition and all you can do is help them the best ways they can. And that's something we can talk about next time, because I think that could be another two, three hour conversation. Yes, it could be. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I think, I think we'll talk about that next time, but you know, I love you so much, Natalie. You oh, are amazing. I I'm going to put you on the bottom of our YouTube website. You have a YouTube channel, right? Yes, I do. Okay, so I'm going to put you on the bottom of our YouTube channel because I think people who follow us with epilepsy or any parents or family members, you know, could really benefit from your website. And I'll also put you on my website in our resource um, uh, area. We have a page just for all helpful resources. This way people can look for you, find you, and, you know, they can go to your organization. But just before we go, I really would like you to just explain to people some of the great highlights of your website and then explain. I know we've already talked about your contact information, but remind them one more time how they can get, um, you know, hold you. So just tell them a few things that you have to offer that you think are very beneficial. Our website is at www.defeatingepilepsy.org. We have our community resource tabs where when you go down, there's all sorts of different information and information for services. We offer a scholarship for um, college students who are battling epilepsy, and we're working towards starting to create workforce development opportunities to help people with epilepsy who are able to work, get the skills they need to find gainful employment. And as far as educational tools, in addition, we have our blog on our website where you can read all sorts of different articles about different types of seizures, epilepsy, conditions 
conditions related with it. And then on our YouTube channel, we take our blog articles and turn them into videos. And we also have additional information when it comes to things like diet, medication. There's a lot of, lot of different resources so that people who are dealing with epilepsy can get a better understanding what they're dealing with so that they can make better decisions for themselves. Natalie, thank you so much for coming on the show. You are Thank amazing. you for having me. I, I love you so much. You know, I'm I love so you too. Grateful. Thank you for your work. Oh, thank you. And, you know, I, I hope to see you soon and maybe we can talk more about, you know, caregivers and go, you know, go over all the things that, you know, family members need to know that way we can try to put them in the right direction too. So thank you so much for everything. It was a great pleasure speaking with you today. Great to speak with you too. I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Me too. Thank you. Thank you.